Hello everybody out there in comic book land. My name is George Serrano, aka the Don, and we are here for episode three, because everything good comes in threes, of the Major Issues Podcast brought to you by Comic Book Click. And I'm not alone. I'm being accompanied by fellow comic book clicker. Sir, introduce yourself. My name is Dan the Comic Book Man and George, thank you for having me. Yes, Dan My the pleasure. Comic Man is here in studio. I mean, we got to hang out with Yogi, you know, a little bit there. We got to hang out with Claudius Maximus. And now Dan the Comic Man, the click is growing ever so big. I mean, we, this is the latest and greatest thing to come to comic books and comic book media here on Major Issues. And we decided that this week it will be a little bit of a special edition of the Major Issues Podcast. Look, episode three, and we're already giving away special editions. We're going to go and take a deep dive into the 2009 American superhero film, Watchmen, directed by Zack Snyder. And it seems to be the perfect time to delve into this movie because we've already kind of went into Doomsday Clock issue one. The Watchmen are back. They seemingly are knocking on the doors of the DC Universe, and their characters will be meeting the characters of the DC Universe very soon so i decided that it would be a good idea to talk about how big this film was how big the uh well the source material the uh 12 issue miniseries was written by alan moore and to see i mean like i said it's been 10 years uh how we feel about it after so much time has passed so the movie still holds up to me it i watched it recently and it's still a very explosive and interesting movie you know Zack Snyder did a great job. What's your history behind this film? Because in 2009, um, I was actually overseas. I was actually in Iraq when this film came out. So I missed a lot of its um, the promotional material behind it. I saw some of it, but I couldn't really get a handle on what the film was going to be. So I didn't have like this explosive um, excitement towards it. And I also wasn't very familiar with the um series the the mini series written by Alan Moore. Now that's my fault because this book is amazing. And and since then I have read it and it is amazing and it is listed I think on Time magazine's top 100 novels, American novels to read. Like the only comic book up there is this Watchmen book. Um and so I had no history with it, fell in love with it, but I see that how people can have their problems with it. Um how you know to some people it's their favorite take on the superhero genre and with others they see it as a little bit too gratuitous or a little bit too bleak but um i'm a, I'm a fan of this film and i think that it it needs to exist in the pantheon of superhero films um just because of the message that it sends and its take on what superheroes you know the other side of the superhero life the less glamorous side of the superhero life what's your history behind this film and um were you excited initially when it when you heard it was coming out did you have a history with the comic book um, and if not, what kind of feelings did you have going in, and were you justified in feeling that way afterwards? Well, well, for the first maybe I'd say year of its release, I had no idea what this movie was. I have no history with the comic book whatsoever, and just one day it was on TV, and I had nothing to do for three hours, seeing how it was director's cut, and I just watched it. And when I was watching this movie, I started falling in love with everything about it yes it's long but it 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 doesn't feel like too slow and it's not too quick paced where you don't marinate in every scene you watch you do you get to see everything develop in front of your eyes from the expositions aren't that ham-handed and aren't that forced like even the opening the opening slow-mo Zack Snyder style you know, it may be over stylized, but it's a style we all recognize. Yeah, I mean, he that, Zach Snyder definitely brought his flair, and I guess maybe uh, you know instead of doing what we normally do, which is a paint by numbers recap of the plot, and then uh, stopping at the important parts, I think we should just talk about the bigger ideas that this film uh, presents, and um, some of the overarching things that have happened because of this film. Um, this film has a, a tremendous legacy. One of those things is this is the first f- uh, superhero film that Zack Snyder directs. So um, I wanted to do that for a second and talk about Zack Snyder, the director. Now, um, Zack Snyder got this film off of the success of 300. And um, a lot of the things that made 300 what it was are here. The slow motion shots, you know, the um, the the contrast in colors. Um, and it it was important for him to bring these tools over, but it was also important for him to adapt straight from the page 
what Alan Moore created because um, that twelve panel system in comics, you know, that was revolutionary. The way um, Alan well, see, Moore that was used the thing that. is he they they said that this was an unfilmable comic. Yeah, that, that, it, that this was thing, on yeah. the chopping block for years in Warner Brothers. Like for they a very could long not time, for a very long time, it was called the un, unadaptable. Like, how do you un- adapt the unadaptable? Um, and Zack Snyder did it. Now, now it's very polarizing because you know, you, yeah, it depends on who you ask. Some people don't re- don't like this movie at all. Some people think it's very self indulgent. Think it's overly long. Think the ending makes no sense. The ending makes a whole lot of sense, and no one. Yeah, no. I, people don't give it give it the credit what it's due. But um, after this, Zack Snyder ends up getting you know the bulk of the work over there at DC Films. Uh, it's because of things like Watchmen. It's because of things like Three Hundred that he gets BVS, um, that he gets Justice League. As we know it, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, I guess is depending on who you ask. But what did you think about the style of how Watchmen was shot, and how much of that do you think is Zack Snyder versus? literally just taking it from the page because i are i say this constantly um there's a lot of people that say uh wh- how, how could that comic movie do so bad a lot of comic fans get really up in arms and they'll they'll argue and they'll say you know the source material was there the source material is there and when they say that they don't mean that um basically that just the p- main plot points of the character or the character motivations are on the written page but when a comic book is written you have to direct there has to be there are camera yeah, it, angles it's, it's, it's very subjective because it, you, the comic book panels aren't moving right it, it's your perception of that comic you're reading you know it's just like storyboarding you know you could throw up the storyboard all day it's how your brain makes the movie work right and the, i mean that think about it, that's even the harder thing right because if i'm drawing a character it's way harder to quote unquote move the camera around that character if I'm drawing them. If I have the camera in my hand, it's easy, right? I just I want an over-the-shoulder shot. But now if I'm drawing, I have to draw that over-the-shoulder shot. Then I have to zoom past what's over their shoulder to show something. That's the, the beauty behind um, comic book panels and with the 12-panel system, it was always building tension. And so how much of the genius of this film do you think is just going literally by the book? Or do you think it is the storyboard that is the majority of this film's genius? Or is a lot lot more credit deserved to Zack Snyder? Well, Zack Snyder deserves a lot of the credit for how visually this movie was shot. You know, uh, from the slow motions and and the large pan-ups and from... uh, It's just... A lot of it is the genius of Alan Moore, too. Alan Moore's comic is great. It's a fantastic novel. Anybody should pick this up and read it. You will not go wrong. But we can't t- say that Zack Snyder had like you know no part of it. Like he's, if you look at Three Hundred, even look at Day Dawn of the Dead, not Day. Of the Dead, if you look at Dawn of the Dead, he can handle these large set pieces. Yeah, he and he he does um, shoot action well. I mean, I I personally like his slow motion stuff. But like I said, I can see how some people can see it's a little bit indulgent. But um, this was a fresh take on the superhero genre. Like I said, so. I, this I was seeing all of this. Oh, yeah, this had for the no first winners. Time. Nobody won in this movie. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's another. Even when you win, you still lose. That's a big thing, and and there was consequences in this movie. This was a comic book movie with consequences. This wasn't your grandpa's Superman. Well, you know, we this the the both the film and the miniseries were the forerunners of a lot of the ideas that people talk about now in comics. You know, the Keen Act that's introduced is basically you know. The modern day version of that would be the Superhero Registration Act, or as the MCU fans know, as the uh, Slokovia Accords. The same idea, right? That superheroes, these mass vigilantes, need to be put in check, and uh, we don't need them anymore. Or you know, they need to understand that they are not judge, jury, and executioner. Well, that was another and, great concept. There was a comic book world where we don't want superheroes, right? Like, just just imagine, you know, everybody wants Spider-Man, everyone needs Wonder Woman, everybody loves uh, Batman, but this is a world where nobody wanted these people. Very, and- um, very, like, that. that's very much how society was in those early 80s and the 90s, right? We're bucking against the traditions of normal stuff. This book, and also, you know, the book that comes after it, The Dark Knight Returns, from um, Frank Miller. You know, it really takes these colorful characters that we've been reading about in books, right? Pow, bam, zip, 
and puts blood and, you know, broken bones. Yeah, it gives you a sense of realism. Um, and I want to commend Zack Snyder and, you know, everyone just behind the film for allowing the realism of all that to be shown. I mean, we get a superhero rape scene in this film. You know, that's not oh, something yeah. you're oh, getting... Yeah. That's not something you're getting in every uh, superhero. You're not turning on Spider-Man and seeing that. So it's it's good to see that they didn't shy away. I mean, I'm not one for gratuitous sexual abuse or violence in film. But if it is to serve the narrative and if it is to show the transparency of the real world, things that actually happen in the real world, then, you know, yeah, I'm all... Because a lot of the... Uh, all of the Minutemen really weren't... They didn't have superpowers. That was another thing about this movie. These, these, they're not supposed to have superpowers in The Watchmen, except for Doctor Manhattan. They're all just supposed to be like you know, ex-military, uh, CIA spies. You know, they're, they're just they just really good at fighting. That's true. Let's get into let's get into the characters. Before I, we get into the characters, do you think this is one of Zack Snyder's better films? Would you put it in, uh, let's would... say, the top three of his of his filmography? I would say this is the best Zack Snyder that we will ever that we're ever gonna get. And as okay. much as I love Man of Steel, Man of Steel was done beautifully. This is the best we're gonna get of Zack Snyder. I don't think it's gonna get any worse or any better. Okay, I can see that. Um, but yeah, let's get into the cast of characters. Um, you know, we have Rorschach who has no powers. Um, a little bit of a dark, brooding take on the noir detective. Um, he is absolutely out of his mind. Yeah, this is this movie is really like crime noir type, especially with the Rorschach scenes where it's Rorschach's journal and. And who would you say is the um, protagonist in this in this film? Um, obviously, one could argue the various protagonists is in the mini in the miniseries, but films usually follow one well, person. Well, we're going by like like you know overall do gooder. Well, the person because, you're, I guess the person Rorschach's you're rooting morals for. morals were there. You know, as much as he was, it, even though he did kill, his morals were there. You know, men get, get go to jail, dogs get put down, that line. You know, like, I would say, like, Rorschach and uh, Daniel, whatever his last name was, Night Owl. Dryberg, Daniel, Dry, Dryberg? I think it was Dryberg, yeah. yeah. But like, those two are definitely, like, you know, protagonists. I mean, antagonist is really, you know, the what makes the movie drive forward what what drives the plot forward and for that i would definitely throw uh count the comedian there as a you know he's also in that position but with, with rorschach it's it's odd because even if he's not the main protagonist it's uh, he's undeniably besides dr manhattan the the fan favorite oh definitely he steals he, he steals the show a lot of the times he steals the show that whole prison sequence was great. Part of that is how he was written. The other part of that is Jack Earl Haley, who I think does a really, really good job. And he actually uh, campaigned for this role. He knew all about this comic, uh, was all for it, really wanted to be Watchmen. I mean, Watchmen, Rorschach, and uh, went out of his way to and let people I'm know that. And I'm glad that he got it because I think he does a great job. His, I like his raspy uh, voice. I like the stilted dialogue. Like, he'll just say stuff like, not wet or, <laughs> you know, like, just just got up. And then, yeah, and just Hungry. the whole mannerisms of just the way he moves and everything. He always has his hands in his pocket. He's always talking in like short sentences. What's your best uh, Rorschach impression? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, Rorschach's journal. I'm trying to think of. A, I'm trying to remember a line. Uh, Hungry, you know, cracked eggs. Men go to prison. Dogs get put down. Uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good there. Um, and I mean. Rorschach has, he has a sense of justice that's a bit skewed, even though he's the fan favorite. That's that's also what I wanted to bring in with this. Probably the most violent member of this uh, this team uh, at this point. At at, um, at that point, the uh, post breakup or even a little bit before their breakup. Yeah, I guess he would be. Well, I don't know if he would be seen as the most violent of the Watchmen because uh, comedian was was pretty gratuitous in, in the things he did, like, you know, especially the scene where he jumped out of Night Owl's helicopter and just starts gunning people down with a shotgun. Like I'm interested in seeing, though, what the comedian was doing prior to being killed by Adrian. Because if the Keen Act was up, were they effectively all not saving the world? And, and well, if that's the was, case... Um, he was working with Adrian, and comedian was the first one to crack during Adrian's plan, because the Comedian knew that Adrian wanted to blow up every major city and then blame it on Dr. Manhattan. 
right. and that's when they had that key scene where uh, he went to um, what uh, the whatever his name Malik when he went right. to Malik's house to the, in the, the middle the... of the night crying. It was because of Adrian's plan to blow up the major cities and blame it on Manhattan. That's when he couldn't do it anymore. And then I guess the um, Vite got wind that he was like cracking. That's when the story starts off him going to his house to kill him. Spoiler alert for anybody that doesn't know. Oh, no, know. this is a complete. I mean, if you haven't figured this out already, this is a completely spoiler, super spoiler review of uh, yeah, spoilers, the people. Watchmen film. But, um, yeah, Adrian goes to to go to comedian's house personally and kills him, which makes sense from when you see the three on the two on one fight at the end, where Rorschach and Daniel couldn't even hold their self against him. Like, but am I supposed to, am I supposed to believe that Rorschach in this time is just? I mean, he's put the entire this entire um, missing persons case. Well, not missing persons case, murder case. He's put this entire mystery. On his own back, like no one else has. Like Adrian is like, oh, because he, he was being a, dead. Yeah, but he was being a conspiracy theorist. He was thinking someone's picking off costume heroes. Do you think? So almost in his paranoia, he almost trips into this yeah, entire no, he uncovered, plot of this. Movie. Yeah, he uncovers an entire plot that no one knew was going down, all because he thought somebody was picking off costume heroes. This is true, and that's what brings him to and he the, never conforms. Yeah, even in the face of Armageddon, he won't. He will not compromise. We get a little bit of his backstory too. Apparently, his mother was a lady of the night. Um, oh yeah, that, I, I, that's another thing that I love is this is an origin story, but we're not getting it shoved in our face that it's an origin story. We're just getting you know expositional flashbacks, and as long as it's two three minutes and it's really quick and it's getting out of the way, you know, I don't have to see it for twenty minutes. Then I don't mind it. I don't mind little flashbacks. I understand, and you know, it's 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 hard because I imagine. From when I re- when I read it, a lot of those flashbacks took place in time, like they actually you know took place chronologically, and um, but you don't have that time here in a film like this. Even the theatrical cut is shorter than the director's cut. You have even less time than that. So what a way to show all the information that you have to show with these flashbacks. I think that was a, a good a good idea to have the flashbacks as they are in. And a lot of them made sense. A lot of them, it was it's it served the narrative, the overall narrative, like um like finding out that Laurie's father's the comedian. Yeah. That all th- all those flashbacks, like all those three choppy flashbacks, made sense and because they it can, served. Right, they build on each the other. The twists narrative. Right, they build on each other. Um, but we with that Rorschach backstory, we see that he's had kind of a messed up childhood, which leads him to be the kind of. I mean, he's homophobic. He's uh, violent. He's um. Angry, yeah. Uh, but he was he he was he wasn't as violent and murderous until he saw that little girl that died during that case. He was right, exactly. Like and if it wasn't for that case where he saw that little girl die for nothing, he wouldn't be. He says himself, he saw he saw the the city's underbelly, right? And then he could never look away or something and, like that. And as you know, you know, well, all these characters here were based. Adam Moore based them on Charlton comics characters. Most people see DC characters, but it's actually DC bought Charlton Comics. He wanted to use actual Charlton Comics characters. DC said no, so he just took outlines of them. So Rorschach is actually modeled after the question. But I think in morality, in morality, he's actually um, more modeled after Batman. Uh, this whole... hey, He's a Batman that kills. Right. This is the Batman that, in the instance of seeing Joker do his worst deed, kills the Joker. Has had enough. Says enough is enough, and this is that almost then that slippery slope that Batman. Well, but then yeah, but then that's where it shows the difference between Batman and Rorschach, because Batman said it himself. You know, it, it all it takes is that one time to kill, and then next thing you know, you're a judge, you're an executioner. Easy. Yeah, and so I feel like uh, Rorschach is almost a a dark mirror to Batman in showing what can happen. Like I think exactly. Batman like, should well, always be. This- this can be you if you yes. don't mess up. He should always be conscious. Batman should always be conscious that that's how far it get, it, it can go. And with them two seemingly, probably, hopefully, going to meet each other in some way, shape, or form in the comics, it, it'll be an exciting uh, an exciting duo, I think. Uh, and little tidbit. But what do you think of Dr. Manhattan and the whole, like, hit, hit, that the fact that he's growing even bigger now in the comics as well, opposed to how it was in the movie? Um, he's getting out there now. Like they're making him a big part of things. People are always going to like the best anything. Right. And we were told that Superman was the greatest superhero of all time. We've never seen a superhero do what 
Dr. Manhattan has done in both this film and in um comics. And you know, with the with the average person not being a comic fan, this blew people's minds to have an idea that this man can just walk around and deal with like fusion and arc reactor technology while also making love to his uh girlfriend while also being played with like a puppet by Adrian. It's this idea that this is the ultimate superhero and everything else that we've been kind of rooting behind kind of isn't kind of falls flat in comparison. But what I think is going to happen with the, uh, the Watchmen now being brought into the DC universe is I think that they're going to try to humanize Dr. Manhattan, bring him down a couple steps because he is at this point a God. And at several points in here, he says, you know, I may not be the God you think of, or if God does exist, I'm nothing like him. Um, God, uh, I believe the way it says, God is real and he is American. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things said about uh, God more so with him than any other superhero. We get the Jesus allegories with Superman sometimes. And Superman would be, I guess, in the same sense that I said that Rorschach was the question, um, Dr. Manhattan is modeled after Doc, uh, Captain Adam. And as you know, he has the atomic symbol for uh, hydrogen on his uh, head. He makes that on his head. Hydrogen bomb, atom bomb, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's all there. But in the same way that I said that he also, that Rorschach had a little bit of Batman in him, I can see the dark parts of Superman in Dr. Manhattan and not feeling like he belongs and feeling like he is above oh, yeah, that, that, everything else. That's another one that's like, that's like Superman at his absolute worst. Like, the day Superman, like, completely feels isolated from all of humanity, he's just going to, like, stop caring. How did you feel about his portrayal in this film, um, Manhattan, and his uh, I decreasing Billy humanity or decreasing, I guess you would call it, just he had, he just cared less. He had well, like, his just best this. friend and his fiance left him in a, in, in a time capsule reactor to let him die. Yeah. They they wouldn't even watch him. They just, they just left to let him die. So, like, you know, you, well, look how he is in the movie. Like, you can feel, like, every day he just backs two feet away from humanity just two feet further two feet further till 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 pretty soon he can't feel anything and by the end of the movie yeah he doesn't feel anything i mean he goes to another planet at one point you know he started his own civilization because he couldn't deal with with the human race he says if i uh if i I ever get bored of life that's all i gotta say if i'll get bored of life i'll go ahead and create it um so with with this idea of dr manhattan being a god you get this idea also of People trying to coerce bigger ideas for their own narrative. For instance, they use Dr. Manhattan as a war deterrent to say, look at this guy and look what he can do. Watch. Hey, Vietnam, look what this guy can do. He can walk Yeah, but through. it was even worse because they didn't just want to pin it. It's not that they wanted to blow everybody up and pin it on Dr. Manhattan. They wanted to completely change hands of the war. Like, listen, stop fighting us. Stop fighting Russia. We should all band together and fight this one guy who can literally, oh. in a snap of a finger, you know, end us all. If, and that's the thing that Adrian didn't think about. That if Dr. Manhattan really wanted to, in a snap of a finger, he can end everyone. Well, that's the, that's the argument that Batman has against Superman. But with Dr. Manhattan, it's weird that... Well, it's not weird. It's actually not weird. This, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's actually very fitting that if America did have the Superman, if if we did have this all-powerful being, that we would put it in front of the American flag and say, hey, don't mess with this country, because this country well, is yeah, very... that's why we had that scene where they went to Vietnam, and he's just sh- blowing people up. That's exactly my point. There's no, They have an entire army behind him. He doesn't need any... Any of that army that's there. Yeah, no, he there, doesn't need those armies there. there. It's literally a show of force. It's literally America, you know. Um, this is us. This yeah. is what we can do. America. Fuck yeah. Yeah, you know, just the Dr. Manhattan edition where his, you know, Johnson is swinging uh, about five feet above yeah, everybody's head. I think they covered that up because you don't need that. Like, but this, um, this is a kid's movie, damn it. Well, you know, he got a nice little, nice little underwear kind of deal there. How yeah, do you a little feel about, George of the Jungle sling. How did you feel about Ozymandias' relationship with Dr. Manhattan because that has also been a, a big, what you can say, um, conflict, right? The, the, this God versus man or almost uh, science versus religion aspect of it where Adrian is the smartest man on earth. Adrian has figured out answers to everything. Dr. Manhattan is Earth. He is everything seemingly at this point, right? He can well, is he really matter. the smartest man? I mean, he's like Rorschach figured him out. 
He did, uh, but Rorschach, I, but, but Rorschach figured him out because he's that crazy enough to figure him out. It's almost like that idea like is crazy. He, got, he enough had to, to work. leave. He had to have left some sort of bread com- breadcrumb behind for Rorschach to figure it out. Like Rorsch- and the thing is, and Rorschach he couldn't even kill him. He tried. He couldn't even get him. In. He, he he pinned Moloch's death on him. Got him to go to jail and still couldn't get him stopped. I also feel like Rorschach had pieces of it. But if it wasn't for Ozymandias laying the entire thing out once everyone gets to Antarctica, you know, I don't really know how much Rorschach has. And even if Rorschach did have it all, no one's believing him. I'm very interested to see what's happening. What's going to be the after? Oh yeah, the, the, the that journal. um journal. Yeah, the after effects of this journal because it will have effects in the Doomsday Clock. Somebody seemingly picked it up. Somebody read it. Somebody knows. What's going on there? And the first issue of Doomsday Clock deals with the aftermath of everybody figuring out that, hey, Adrian lied. Hey, that big thing that that uh, was said. Well, see, that's what's, that, that, I, that I know is what's different from the comic. I know that this time it, it wasn't all the major cities being blown up by one bomb. I know it was like New York getting some yeah. sort of alien space monster, like tentacle right. squid. Yeah, they teleported a, a, a telepathic squid to Earth, and that seemingly killed it bunch of people and then they use that to be like you see dr manhattan or, or just threats to the outside are what we should be worried about in this film they point exactly at dr manhattan in the yeah, book they say like this, about this man is walking threats. radiation like yeah um well if we're gonna talk about manhattan let's get let's go right to that how do you feel about the cancer angle how do you feel about the entire like i kind of thought you, that was brilliant you've given everybody that you care about cancer well and it makes sense because he's like i just said he's walking radiation you know, overexposure to radiation is what causes cancer cells to grow and for tumors to become there. So it it was beautiful because you know what? It also helps serving the narrative. The narrative of he feels less connected to humans every day, and if now he feels like he's giving people cancer, how is he ever supposed to form a relationship with somebody? That's very true. I think a lot of people forget that aspect of it. Like is you, that you, he you... needs to forget. He needs to. He needs to forget what it feels like to be human. He needs to forget what it feels like to have friends, to have a lover. Because he might cause all those people serious harm. So then the only way uh, to do that is to make it seem like he's giving it, he is giving his best friend and the woman he loves cancer. I thought it was brilliant. It it, it showed, like I said again, this this fight where um Doctor Manhattan is seemingly just unstoppable but yet his emotions um get the better of him at, at various points in this film, even going so far as to leave Earth entirely and go to Mars. Um, you saw him dealing with the battle of morality with the comedian. The comedian shoots a woman, a pregnant woman, in uh, Vietnam. And oh, no, yeah. The comedian's like the other opposite end of the spectrum. Like, the, the, this is your superhero. This is your, like, bad guy in disguise. Like we're that, And he's seemingly the reason why they had the Keen Act in the first place is because, you know, you can't just throw frilly costume on and say you're a superhero it has to go with the actions who do you think is more jaded at this point the comedian or Rorschach I think the comedian Rorsch- remember Rorschach gets off on his morality he so may be more, brutal so you he think may- he still believes that there, there can be justice out there yes, in the world good whereas and evil. the comedian doesn't see any, any why do you think worth it. then that's why comedian died if the comedian was a bad guy, he would have just let him. And not saying that you know Dryberg is a bad guy, but if to me, if if Rorschach was a bad guy, he would not. He would have just let Adrian get away with his plan. I mean, Adrian at no point was threatening Rorschach. It's actually Manhattan who stands in his way to say, you know, you can't let this secret that we have now all seemingly agreed to hold. You cannot be the one thing to unravel all that. No, yeah, and but he didn't care because it's the right thing to do. Justice. It, it's it's an skewed form of justice, but it's justice nonetheless. Well, he says once a man has seen society's black underbelly, he can never turn his back on it, never pretend like you do, that it doesn't exist. Like, um, And he has seen the very worst in humanity, whether it's his upbringing, whether it is the, what happened with that uh, man who I believe... Listen, was, I think when you grow up with a mother a that never loved you, that is one of the worst... But the first criminal that he seemingly kills, he fed she was, uh, the criminal. Fed a little girl to a dog. Yes, bunch of dogs. Girl, and once you've seen that, if you're talking about seeing the very worst of the worst. Oh, that's I the mean, worst because you, you're, you're raping a little girl. You're killing a little girl and then you're feeding her dead body to a bunch of dogs. That's the worst you can get when you're being a, a vigilante detective. 
And, you know, you know, what, 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 where were they even living? I mean, he, they got no powers. It looks like regular. I mean, they. I don't think they ever pointed out. It was some sort of. It was either New York or like Los Angeles. Had to be one of them. Like, definitely. But we have uh, just that juxtaposition there: Ozzy Mandius, Doctor Manhattan, Rorschach. Like, you have the smartest man. You have the most determined man, and then you have like the most powerful man. And then you have the everyman with with the uh, super fighting abilities. Yeah, well, the, I think the everyman here is... is no, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Night Owl. Night Owl. Yeah, he's, he's really the everyman. Yeah, he ends up being the everyman of this series. He ends up um, being a, a, just a side a side body, a, just a tri- in a triangle love relationship with Manhattan and Silk Spectre. It's now, something I, didn't, I did not get from... And I don't know how exactly you portray it, but something I didn't get from the... Uh, the film more than I got from the comic is that Night Owl, when we see him, is not only retired, but like way out of shape, way unmotivated, way unhappy. Now, I kind of saw him unhappy. I didn't really feel like uh, Patrick Wilson was all that out of shape. But he apparently put on 25 pounds to play the out of shape, you know, uh, no, Dan Patrick, Dryberg. Patrick Wilson did an amazing job because I've seen, oh, him, I, yeah, great. I've seen him in a lot of like B movies, like, you know, A-Team. You know, you know, insidious or whatever. One of the conjuring, one of them. I don't remember. They're all the same. But he, he's, he's, he's a different kind of actor. He's like a different sort of method actor. But to see him in a movie like this, where he puts on the weight, he puts on the body scale. It, it's great. It, it, it warms my heart. I love Patrick Wilson. They uh, do a lot of to humanize him. Like I said, he is the everyman. He's the guy who can't even get it up. Right, a superhero who can't get it up. Literally, hu- humanizing these people. Like literally putting them on the lowest. Not the lowest, like like something we can now we. Oh, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, like when you retire from a job. A it's, like, it's like if you've had yeah. a job like your entire life, and then you just have to retire after like forty years of service. You know, I like, mean the war, the soldier that returns from war and got no place to go, right? Exactly. The, the uh, twenty year cop or a correction officer who's lived that life that one way and now has to retire. The firefighter so now he doesn't know what he does. Yeah, he 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 he, he sees the original Hollis Mason in every other week because that's the only person that cares that he was night owl that's the only yeah that's the that... only other night because that was the first night owl how so. do you how do you feel about that the inclusion of the hollis mason the um the little bit we got I know, the, the all those, yeah all those little minuteman scenes that we got the minuteman scenes i i thought it was great i, I mean, this I, film I, has my favorite like title card sequence ever like oh, that the, whole that times opening. are changing with the minutemen <sighs> that opening. showing where they where they've all gone and we see a, a bit of those murders that took place uh you know with um, some of the early members. The of only that. thing I would say is I would I would have loved to seen some of those how some of those scenes played out, like um, Mothman getting dragged away oh, into yeah, an insane exactly. asylum. I would have loved to well, see what are, he was doing. Like, you are a moth person, so I, I can see how that. Happens. I'm a very fan. Of, I'm a big fan of moths. That's... Now, now the thing, now the things that, like you said, the things that could be extended. Fingers crossed, get extended in the HBO. Uh, mini series that's supposed to be coming out. Apparently, HBO has green lit. Yeah, and this uh, is a uh, who? Damian Lindelof. Damian Lindelof. I'm a fan of Damian. Prometheus. Lindelof. I'm a, I I'm a fan of his show, The Leftovers, which deals with a lot of emotional um how humans deal with grief. So it will be interesting to see how he sees how these humans deal with uh, the positions that they were put into. But um, people are wondering whether it's going to draw from the mini series itself, or there'll be a longer version. Of this movie, or well, there was a lot of a lot of things in the min- in the miniseries novel graphic novel that there wasn't in the movie. Like, right. um, but we do get shades to like uh the comic within a comic. Yeah, the uh the Black Freighter comic that's in the. Yeah, they have the newspaper guy and the black boy that reads the comic in the graphic novel in the movie. Right. Like they have that. They're one of the first. They're one of the people that hug each other when the bomb's about to go off in New York. Like yeah, that's, yeah. That's they, them. They, so they have those Easter. They pay eggs. tribute, but I, like you, like we were saying before, how much can you possibly put in here with the series? Though, like you said, maybe that will be a, a an a, uh, example of a way that you can. Uh, yeah, use if they don't make the it page. just 12, 12 episodes, if they can find a way to make it, like you know, stretch it out. Like I understand there was twelve. See twelve books in the series, but if you could like stretch it out to like maybe twenty four episode miniseries, give us like maybe a year, a half of a year, a year and a half to and just soak everything in, enjoy everything, it'd be great. I mean, and you because got not a lot you of people want to sit down for three hours, and I understand them. You kind of got to be careful though, because as you know, Warner Brothers, I mean DC, tried to cash in on the hype of this Watchmen stuff by coming out with the before Watchmen comics. Which were not seen as necessary, almost. Uh, that no, I, I tried said. reading one of them, and um, I think I tried reading Night Owls or something like that. I just I couldn't get into it. 
Yeah, it, it, it was like, just a little not weird. necessarily bad. It's just people were like people felt that the way the Watchmen ended was fine, and that they, you know, they what they wanted more of they didn't get seemingly in those books. So you you got to make sure that what you are presenting is something that the fans ask for, which is a problem that Doomsday Clock is is seemingly gonna face. Is like, you know, this has been so well, it's untouched. Been, it's, it's an, you know the thing is, I think it, the time is right. There's enough time. Because what, Watchmen came out in like, what, 84, 85? So it's been about like 30 years. It's and then, weird and then because... the, the comic just came, like the comic book movie came out like eight years ago. So it's still, you know, it, 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 they're all out there, but it's been enough time for us to forget about it. So I think throwing this inclusion in could be really smart marketing wise and just like fan service wise. I, would love, to, I would love to see an, yeah, an after Watchmen comic spin off with the Justice just League. With the DC characters. You know, the characters that uh, we know and love. What I think is kind of ironic is the fact that I would see Watchmen as a cautionary tale, right? Like, this is our superhero genre taken to the grimmest extremes. And, you know, while we can celebrate that, because I'm all for all alternative realities, right? I'm all for, like, well, this is if they're all Russian, and this is if they're all Nazis, and this is if they're all depressed. Like, like again, I'm with that. But they almost took that and used that to base how they want to make their DC movies now. I see a lot of similarities to how Batman is written um, with Rorschach and, like, the, the bleakness of it. Let's see, that's the problem. Everybody wants to be Dark Knight. Everybody wants to try and be Watchmen. And they lose out on what made those movies, those movies in general. Like, the, like the Watchmen served a purpose to be, to be filmed and to adapt an unadaptable film. Right. And it served its purpose by, by being able to adapt an unadaptable film. It also had a lot to say, but like I said, about the superhero genre. It had something to say. This is not a film that decided to be... Like, this is not yeah, a book a that decided to be made just to be made. Like, Alan Moore is a creative genius. He had things he wanted to say about good and evil and how skewed it can be and how you could do good things for evil reasons. Do and the means really... Ju- do the ends justify the means truly. Exactly. And with superheroes, uh, the genre, sometimes we don't think about the uh, consequences to the effects of, of things like that. Like I said, I believe things like Civil War, uh, the book and the movie don't come out unless this book comes out. Unless Watchmen comes out to say, well, this is a book in which people are putting, um, making superheroes deal with the consequences of their actions. Yeah, which once again comes down to just that. Consequences. This movie had consequences. You know, you know, uh, the comedian rapes the f- silk, the silk spectry. Carla, G- Carla Gugino's silk spectry. What happens? We get Malin Acker's silk spectry. Yeah, she's Malin born. Ackerman. I didn't. I'm not a big fan of either. Uh, uh, silk spectry. Oh, I, I love Carla Gugino, and I would have loved to have seen more scenes of her, like you know, fighting and kicking ass, because you know she can. She's done it. She's done it. She may be old, but she does it. The most I saw her as is is like this weird. Like I didn't, I didn't like the old people makeup thing. So oh, like, yeah, her, she's she sitting really there, fat cheeks with that old person makeup. Very odd. And the fact, and the fact of the matter is, the woman who played uh, Malin Ackerman's mother is seven years older than her. You know, so oh, uh, how yeah. old can you make? How you know, seemingly old can you make her? But this idea, like you know, you hear the conversation between Silk Spectre Two's mother and father, where. Uh, the father's like, I took you know you and your daughter in, and that guy who tried to rape you, he tried to rape you, so then you like let him try again. Like they were saying some really dark. No, yeah, they were they were bringing about... like really like bad subject matter in a and and seemingly what would be a a kid friendly genre, you know. But but that's the thing, superhero movies don't have to be kid friendly. They don't because good and evil is not good always kid friendly. Just because you're taking your kid to a movie doesn't mean you have to take him to that specific movie. Right, you know that this isn't your granddad's Superman. Once again, how did you feel about the six, the Silk Spectre um, character in general? Uh, and well, she was used your... as the crutch for Doctor Manhattan, and he even said it. You know, like you're my only tie to the outside world. Right. You know, like uh, it once. Uh, so I found that. And once, and once he found out with... that she was, he was, she was screwing Dan. Well, he already he knew. Kinda... That's the thing is he. Did, he knows everything about everything about any time it's going to happen. It's all just the way it, he can't prevent it because human nature. Right. You know, he sees every possible outcome. Well, I also think it's the, I think I also think it's the idea that I could tell you everything that's going to happen to you today 
but you won't know how you're going to react to that till it actually happens. You I know, mean, your you know, react could be a, just another different, it could take you on a different pattern. You even know? if you're not surprised, even if you knew, I can tell you everything you're going to go through today. And I'm like, I mean, uh, tomorrow. And I'm like, and tomorrow you're going to see the cutest puppy you've ever seen. And then you actually see the cutest puppy. You know what I'm saying? Like, even with the knowledge of what was going to happen, I don't think you know how you're going to react until you react. And I think that's what he means uh, when he says that things still have to play out. Like, as, although he sees it, he's still as much a puppet as everybody else. Um, and I think Lori sees that. And when Lori sees that, she almost brings that up to, like, spite him. Like, she almost brings that up to say, like, for somebody who thinks that he's all there, for somebody who thinks that he has this mastery of, of, of life, you're just as much, you know, a pawn in this game as us. And, I mean, do you believe that? Do you believe that uh, um, Dr. Manhattan is just as much of a pawn? Or do you think that was just a, a dig by Silk Spectre in a moment of feeling weak on the, on Mars? Well, it really depends on you know your 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 personal beliefs. You know, my, from my personal beliefs, yes, he's just another pawn, uh, an overpowered pawn, but he's still just another pawn in an otherwise giant chessboard. But the, the, the but he it also it can be just another snap by Silk Spectre because you know he it you can't blame her for cheating because he really just stopped caring. You right. even see it with the fact that he just he brings he makes multiple copies of himself to have sex with Lori just so he doesn't have to waste his time having sex so he can continue. Literally, it's as yeah. much a chore to him as building yeah, the reactor. Yeah, exactly. It's just as another fact, chore. He, he's more interested in, in building the new energy uh, machine. Exactly. He's, he's like, listen. He's like, you know, let me just love. send like three, four guys in there. You know, she she won't notice. Well, think about it, right? It's like people have been making love since cavemen. I'm actually building something that's going to create clean energy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like in, in his, he's always talking about perspective because he says, he, I believe another like cold, because he's throwing down cold lines the entire film. He's one of yeah. my favorite characters, Dr. Manhattan. He says something along the lines of like, the smartest man on earth means as much to me as the smartest termite. Oh you know? yeah, and I'm like, oh, like that's at, that's where he's at in this in this movie. By the time we get to the end, he's so indifferent. He's just a deity. He's so indifferent, and and he was on Earth, got blamed by a bunch of people for cancer, came back to went to Mars, came back to Earth, got blamed for the whole bombing. So you know, I don't blame him for being like. No, I don't I'm blame out, him at all. I'm out of here. Uh, I'm making like this cool glass house. Oh, you don't, no, it was it was a, it's a clock. It's a watch. Was that that was the that's the that's the beauty of symbolism. That big uh, glass tower shit that he was making on Mars was the whole inside frame of a watch. Did you see the happy face on the yes was it on the moon or Mars? One of those two. I, I think uh, it was on Mars. I just believe it was on Mars. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting my big old planets mixed up. I think Mars is the red one. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Which is weird. I wonder if he <laughs> had to like if he had Lori in like her own like atmospheric air, bubble because bubble. like yeah. When, like, my, she was just my, walking around like nothing. One of my favorite parts between Laurie and um, Dr. Manhattan is when she asks him to, like, you know what? You keep saying, I, I don't understand you. I don't understand you. Help me understand you. Do that thing that you do. That's literally what she and then she like, just He just touches her forehead just to see that. The, the, that's how he realized that, that that's what made him, like, more, you know, associated with, with humanity again. Because, you know, Laurie was born out of Stockholm Syndrome. Well, Rape. Yeah, well, the idea... He, he says in a very poetic way that what it's like, like Laurie's birth was like turning air into gold. Um, it's saying that the possibility of that happening, the, the immense possibilities that take place in this world, like you were talking about before, string theory. The fact that in a, in a universe where absolutely everything can happen, we, lived in, we live in a universe, he's thinking, we live in a universe in which the worst man, like the worst hero in the world, and a, a respectable woman... Uh, engaged in a sexual assault situation that then birthed the woman that I'm in love with. Like, I think, I think just the almost the joke, poetic right, justice say, behind right? it, the poetic justice, the the cosmic um irony, um, I think the the bad joke, as they say throughout this film, right? I think that to him more than her, the I, idea that yeah. that that this that the odds of that. More than her. I don't think he loves her at this point when he says this. I, I think, think he, he just says, loves the uh, odds. I think it's like when your dog does a trick for the first time. You're like, you get a new sense of appreciation because you're like, wow, they're a lot smarter than I thought. Like, this is a lot more intricate than I thought. I've been playing off humanity 
as this like as a bunch of cavemen knocking into each other. Maybe there is specks of beauty by default, by this ability to every so often uh, create gold from air or create a lorry from a bad situation like um, the um, sexual assault there. How do you feel about how comedian handled uh, being a father? You know, he kind of tried to step up and talk to her. Um, and I wouldn't want that man 10 feet, 10 feet near my daughter. Well, I wouldn't want that man anywhere near her. He did not sexually assault the mother. That like when he sexually assaulted he the mother, he attempted to rape her. And oh then yeah, she ended up just going out on a date with him exactly. and sleeping with him anyways. Right. That's that's what I'm saying. So, I'm, what I mean to say is that the, what anger is she harboring? Is she angry? Is she harboring the anger of the sexual assault, which I'm assuming is prior? To... Well, I just think she's just harboring the anger of who he is as a person, who Eddie Blake was, and that I guess you we see with her. Dealing with the effects of that choice through her whole life, you know, um, and having those, having the effects of that choice be yeah, put it was ever back since in her it, face. Yeah, that's why she started the drinking. That's why she stopped being the silk spectrum. and why her daughter did take over because, you know, she, she just couldn't cathartically get find a way to get over those feelings that she was harboring over the fact that, yeah, her only child was born... Through Stockholm syndrome from a a rape uh, from a almost rape, yeah. Who the hooded justice stopped it? That was his name, hooded justice. So you know, I I just like how uh, Silk Spectre was able to almost save humanity a little bit, and you know, like by showing Doctor Manhattan a little bit of what he could learn from humanity, or a little bit of yeah, what it wasn't. It wasn't appreciate. totally her. That did it. It was it, it was it was the way he perspective. It was his perspective of it. It's the way he perceived it. He he saw like the most rarest anomalies happen right in front of his own very eyes. Now speaking of anomalies, uh, Ozzy Mandias, Adrian Veidt. Let's talk a little bit about him. The smartest man on the earth. Like I said, we mentioned him briefly before, but this is a person that basically at this. I don't point really think he's the film, smartest man on earth. I think he's just like one. He's just very strategic. He's very calculated. You know, he thinks of everything he possibly can, but he doesn't think of everything he possibly can, and that's why he was stopped. You know, like, even even the world's smartest man got stopped by the world's giantest term. I mean, I mean, but did he get stopped? Because, ultimately, the person that found him out, or the people that find well, him yeah, out... You know, that's the thing is, we don't know if he got stopped, because we don't know if people are going to take Watchmen's Journal as serious as I would like to believe well, that we would take it as. Well, what do you mean when you I say... Like Rorschach's journal, sorry. What do you mean when you say stop, though? That that's I think that's like, where I mean, we're like, confused, okay. because I think with his ability to bring that no, the, starfish yeah, he, in, he, he won. did not get yeah, stopped. Yeah, he won. He won. <laughs> there is no stopping. And, you know, spoiler alert, um, while I don't know, at, as of this recording right now, while I don't know what happens with the actual journal, the rest of the world does find out that Ozymandias was lying about this starfish. And he ends up becoming... Uh, public enemy number one to the point that they're trying to hunt him down. The FBI, the CIA, every country in the world is gunning well, for the well, world's well, exactly. He, he well, it's the, the the needs of the many definitely yeah. outweigh the needs of the few. There, so like he 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 killed like thousands to say no. He saved he killed millions to, to save, save billions. Billion. That's the quote, right? They Just, say yeah, save it's like you million. killed millions to save billions. How did I you, love Matthew Good? How do you feel about um? Do you feel that uh, he was, he was sympathetic to those. I know what he wanted to plan. do. He wanted world peace, and he got it in the most, you know, savagest of ways. Like it was, yeah. He's he's in, in the comics. He's bringing down a squid. In the movies, he's blowing up people, like dropping nuclear bombs. But you know what? If it give, if it makes world peace, if it gives us world peace, sure. I'm for it. If it gives us a reason to like not fight each other and fight an outside party, fight an octopus or some sort of like, a big uh, space, fine, space, sure, uh, squid. But you know, if Doctor Manhattan, if Doctor Manhattan left, he left the galaxy. He went to go find different galaxies, different realities to like make his own world. So it's like, how are we gonna like band together to fight somebody if he's not here? Yeah. So we don't fully know if it's if we got world peace. So really, he could just be killing people, just and it just ends up being that he just killed people. There could be no like reward for that in, action. But in the vein of 
every great villain ever, Ozymandias in this moment believes that there is nothing else to possibly do. There is no other solution for this problem of the world being on the brink well, of nuclear because destruction. He, he's very like, yeah, I'm trying to remember the, the 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 quote word for word, but you know, humanity has seen its end, and every time it sees its end, it restarts itself. Right, know? and he. This is a world in which every country we're we're at war. We are at war. The um, there is yeah, uh, isn't nuclear th- this threats. Is like an alternate reality where we lose World War Two. We have um, you know, we have Nixon on his fourth term, I believe. No, no, no fifth. Fifth, fifth term, bunch of stuff going on. Um, with there, so there are, there is, very much like the Cold War, an arms race. People do have weapons, but in this universe, seemingly we're getting closer and closer to doomsday, where people are willing to set off these nukes. And um, at one point, Dan asks as Ozymandias, like, couldn't John, speaking of Doctor Manhattan, stop all this? And he goes, you know, if they threw a hundred and John stops ninety nine, one would be enough to destroy everything we know and love. And I think in that moment. Just like in BVS when Batman was doing the crunching the numbers, that was too There's much. There's even a one percent chance. Yeah, that one percent or that absolute certainty. That one nuke was enough for Ozzy to figure. You know what? I'm gonna have to put this in my own hands because well, like it I does said, take his one. He said himself, he can't even trust Manhattan to do it. Even if Manhattan dropped one, it'd be it'd be a wrap. So um, he was definitely pushed up against his limits, and a lot of. A lot of what happens with Superman and Dr. Manhattan can be said also with this situation with Ozymandias, where Superman, people say that Superman um, is almost obligated to do, to help as much as he has because of the powers that he has. Same thing with Dr. Manhattan, right? Dr. Manhattan, you have to save everyone because you were the only one with the power to save everyone. It's a gift and a curse. While, uh, While Dr. Manhattan does not feel that weight, Right, I don't feel like Dr. Manhattan feels the weight of like the world is. I'm responsible for the world. Ozymandias does. Uh, Adrian does. Adrian feels like, as the smartest man here, I it's up to me. But because he idolized guys a, like you know like like the Pharaoh Ramsey and uh, and Alexander the Great, he conquers. literally I, I, like he literally says he idolized the man he feels most related to. Died a thousand years before him. Yeah, he said the only person of whom I felt any kinship with died three hundred years before the birth of Christ, Alexander of Macedonia, or Alexander the Great, as you know him. Yeah, but the man conquered nine countries. He did. Didn't he like get bit by a snake or something? Uh, no. Uh, he was poisoned. There you go. I knew it was some kind of. Yeah, he was poisoned, but the, but the man still conquered nine countries, nine empires. Like Alexander the Great was the man. Yeah. And well, Ozymandias is the man. They're all the man. <laughs> I mean, he really... Oh, I, I I feel like he was a little bit more sinister in this movie than he was in the book. I mean, he murders that entire group of scientists, remember? They all have, like, a toast to <laughs> the good life. And when you turn, uh, there's a bunch of dead bodies, and he's walking over them. Obviously, um, both in the comic book and in the uh, miniseries, he is the guy who kills the comedian. And that fight, I thought, was filmed amazingly exponentially un- like un- i un- love that film. unforgettable playing in the background that little nod to 300 when the number one gets knocked off of the room number that's 3001 um or 1300 one of those no, th- i thought it was just that the, the glass breaks at the door and it's just the door number says 300 i didn't see any the one coming off but uh, um it's just crazy that you see like you can almost feel every the sound design of this fight is amazing you can feel every oh every you hear hit. every punch and that's what's so beautiful is because even though we know these guys aren't superheroes. We have to give a little sense of their strength. It has to show that yes, comedian would be able to punch a hole through the drywall. That yeah. you know that that Ozymandias would be able to push his head through a marble, so, you know, sink. Some, some people have had a little bit more problem with that than others. Uh, that in the it. comic book well, they know. they because you know in the comic book they flat out out and out had no powers. In this, they seem to have a little bit of super strength and a little bit of of like mastery. Well, it's not really tactical. super strength. It's just it, it's more of the the, the force of what what you can punch, you know, like like these guys are like the size of heavyweight boxers. Look at Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Yeah. The man's the size of a heavyweight boxer. Matthew Good is like what, like six three? He's pretty tall. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, he is. They you are. know, these guys are these guys are big people, you know, the the pounds pounds per pressure that you would put with a punch. I I I thought it was that's great. crazy because they're the biggest guys and the guy who probably kicks the most ass in this is Rorschach. Breaking fingers, burning people with oh yeah, oil. no Rorschach's fighting and and Jackie O'Harley's pretty short. 
which makes him like this like bull terrier of a of a, of a man. Like this yeah, little, just a little scrappy, chihuahua just biting yeah, at your ankle. Like. This little scrappy uh, dog of justice just you know biting uh pulling at the, your yeah. But leg. I wouldn't mess with Rorschach, no, uh, especially with that prison scene where he just burns the guy with the hot oil. Uh, out of control. Oh, I mean, God. all of it even with the hatchet scene where he where he kills the man who uh, murdered that little girl. So, like I said, all of this is just a. So Adrian Veidt is almost a. Um, He's like a, a Lex, Lex Luthor, Luthor of some yeah, there you sorts. Go. Exactly. Knock He's on definitely wood. a Lex Luthor of some sorts. Uh, where he he knows there's an existence of somebody who is seemingly more powerful than him, but does that see that person as a threat? Almost. You yeah, know, it's more of a different spin because he doesn't. It's not that he wants to kill Manhattan. He like he. Just but his wants, in, his indifference to allowing him to be the center of um, of the world's hate shows me that he doesn't care for him too much. <laughs> you know, unless he just thinks. Ah, John could take it. Oh, which, he doesn't I mean, care for anybody. He just, he just, even when that one flashback of the comedian burning the map, like you know, it it shows that Vite doesn't care about the people. He cares about the the preservation of of uh, just the society. So, like, it's not that one person he cares about. He cares about the overall his overall community. So it's like, so he, do you think that's the spectrum of this film? Do you think that Adrian Vite? And, oh, he's definitely uh, on the opposite end of spectrum well, of Rorschach. Jack. I would say Rorschach is the most Rorschach emotional. Rorschach cares about the person. I think he's the he's the most emotionally he knows tied. He society is fucked up. Yeah, he's the most emotionally tied. Like, his his motives are the most emotionally tied as far as, like, he believes in justice. Because he's just trying to do the, whole right, do the right thing, the whole yeah, movie. Yeah, he believes That's in all. justice. Although he, uh, his means of, of doing these things are sometimes Come questionable. Come death, but, you know, you got to crack a few omelets to make. You got to crack a few eggs to make a couple of omelets, you know. Before we uh, wrap it up, what are some of your favorite scenes of this film? I just want to gush over it. Okay, uh, over uh, this some film of my before, favorite scenes would definitely be the opening fight sequence, you know, and the open the opening title sequence. The but, sequence, you know, like the the the, the first forty five minutes really of the movie is really like a lot of a lot of them I liked, but um, I liked all of Rorschach scenes from the the prison to the, him fighting the cops in the hallway, you know, giving us the very first really hallway fight sequence going oh, down the yeah. stairs like you know we didn't have that yet. it was also kind of haunting to see them washing the comedian's butt off the sidewalk <laughs> as the oh starts. yeah but that's that's the kind of universe that we're gonna get into i like so. i like the silk spectre and um a night owl angle a lot and i like like they're fighting in the the streets just for oh, that yeah, just for that adrenaline bones. rush yeah when they were breaking that. bones out of arms how do you feel about the most awkward love scene ever in a superhero film <laughs> oh god that was just I can't I get it up. There was a secret Cohen. I, I loved Maybe. that's Leonard, Leonard Cohen, Cohen, man. Come on, <laughs> I, I, all respect Cohen. to Leonard Cohen. But you put in like genuine, you know, like you put on pony when you're trying to go. No, yeah, it was way too like awkward. I heard Hallelujah. there was Hallelujah. a secret chord. Yeah, that was, uh, was like, an awkward version of Hallelujah. Like it's just word. I love that version <laughs> of Leonard Hallelujah. Leonard Cohen spoken word just. Get Dan Dryberg all uh, riled up, and then you get the climax, and then he has a climax with the fire being set like that. that, that that's yeah, all because he's the every. Yeah, we, we he has his tech gadgets. He's the every. We didn't but, need. You know. uh, we didn't need a lot of those scenes, but but the love sequences were great. I like the whole dream sequence where they rip each other's faces uh, off, skins see? off, and it's just their uh, their uh, suits. Yeah, because that was from the comics are on too. The other side. Yeah, they were, they found a really cool way to do that. Um. I to tell you the truth, if, I think if I can put if I can pencil in one favorite part of the scene because I actually feel like this part, this part of the film almost takes a life on its own is the Doctor Matt and flashback of the origin. Oh yes, the entire yes. part of where where that's John is score with yeah, when he's the narrating the, the glass that when they're playing like that's basically that water glass effect or whatever, but um. The entire time that John is narrating, I think, is a completely different movie uh, in a good way. Like, that they were able to stitch the perspectives of Rorschach, Night Owl, And it's all about feel. Manhattan. Like, every character arc was a different feel. You had a different emotion towards it. To hear him say what he loved and what he didn't, and then slowly it becomes like, my, you know, my wife thinks that I... I'm, I don't like her because she's getting too old, and she's right. She's but right, I don't yeah, want to tell her. Like that's like, great. Because like that, you like, can see you... him feeling the the the, the dishuffledness. You feel that he's slowly going away from society. And check this out, right? He feels no emotion, right? But feels guilty about feeling no emotion. That's what's <laughs> crazy, <laughs> isn't that? It's crazy? like I, I don't I don't feel bad for cheating. I feel bad that I don't feel bad. Yeah, for cheating. That's exactly what it is. Throughout this movie, it, he's angered. 
because people are constantly telling him, like, you're not plugged in, are you? Like, you're off the reservation. And, and he doesn't see how far he's gone until he literally leaves the planet, you know. And uh, it goes to show that, you know, that's how easy we can detach ourselves when we feel that we are being destructive to others or we feel that no one's understanding our current path or plight. Well, I don't know how he he's he will he would never be able to find someone that understands how he's feeling unless Superman really did exist, I which mean, he is American I mean, from the Kansas. issue one of Doomsday Clock, man, one of the co- one of the covers was Superman and, and Dr. Manhattan and they're saying that Dr. Manhattan is who messed up all this timeline. It wasn't Flash and Flashpoint. It was Dr. Manhattan this entire oh, time. Oh, DC just wants so to, like, we more are about to, reboots and reboots and reboots. Let's we are about to get that. We are about to get Superman meeting Dr. Manhattan. And I just in, want three panels of them just having coffee. In just in that, talking. what do you want to come about that? Now, obviously, we're, we're fantasy booking or whatever, as you will. But with, the, with this happening, these guys are coming to DC. This very delicate situation, right? I to tell you the truth, I hope every one of them dies at the end of Doomsday Clock, just so that... You know, I don't want to see the Silk Spectre Harley Quinn team up book. No. I, I, do, I personally don't. If you do, that's I don't fine. Want Batman and Rorschach, you know, brooding together. You know, I would, I would, I want these twelve issues is long. I want this long series, and I want them to have interactions. But I want it to be a mini series. You know, one, yeah. you know, don't continue the story. Keep it a knockoff, a one off. You know, like I which love, is, which brings the that's, that's the, the whole beauty of, the of novelty, comics, right? Isn't that part of the novelty? Exactly. Is the story closed, and there is no continuation. Like, y- yeah, like yeah. Look at sp- look at Amazing Spider Man. Amazing Spider Man went on for for over close to thirty years. One of the, it was called the longest run running comic book title until they turned it to Superior Spider-Man. But that's the beauty of comics. Just make them 12, 13 issue knockoffs just for us to have something to enjoy, something to marinate. You know, I don't want to have to continue to go back to 500 different issues. Well, you want both, one... right? You want both. You want both the movie wanna, that's going to want... have 18 sequels and you want the one-shot movie that's just great on the merits of it just being alone oh, no, when, great. Yeah, sir, when it's a franchise, I want a franchise. But when it when it just needs to be a trilogy or just have a sequel, then that's all we need. So you know? what what would you want out of the, a Doctor Manhattan and Superman uh, interaction? A lot of deep intellectual conversations about emotions, feeling. I want to know how they feel because there is no way Superman does not feel alone in this world. Do you see Manhattan swing Superman to his side of indifference, or do you see Superman swing Manhattan on his side of hope? I think that they're gonna co- that they're gonna clash in a lot of idealistic ways. Their their ideologies are going to be two different sides of the same coin. Right. And I think it's going to in turn maybe have them fight in a way, in some sort of it, which I don't see. I, I, I don't see anybody being able to fight Manhattan without him <laughs> holding back. It's the same thing yeah. with, you know, with, with uh, Justice League with and or without Superman. It's yeah. only, it's still only 1% difference. You know, Superman could end everything here, but not with this feel- case. Um, how do you feel about the fact that that Manhattan is the only person with powers here? Do you feel like the other ones are kind of wasted being on this team where Manhattan can get everything done by himself? Well, or is this a thing Manhattan where everyone knows has that he can do everything himself? Makes him like you know want to hold back. Like he restrain, he's got to restrain himself a lot. If he really wanted to, he could have fought. A- he 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 didn't need to like go through all of that smacking of the glass and putting yeah. his hand through the building against Adrian. He could have just. You know, maybe, snap his fingers, end it. Maybe one could argue that the inclusion of Dr. Manhattan, right, the, the fact that the government knew that Dr. Manhattan existed made the Kane Act easier to pass, right? Uh, who needs pretenders? Who needs uh, fake hooded superheroes when we have we have ours? Look, he's right here. He's blue. And he does everything we say. We don't need random vigilantes here on the street. Um. So maybe that's the reason why you end up weaponizing a guy like Manhattan and end up getting rid of all the other superheroes because if you have a Manhattan, do you really need anything else? No, especially if you have a Manhattan that doesn't feel any sort of emotion for humans, no compassion whatsoever for his seemingly fellow man, then yeah, like that is that is a dangerous weapon to have. Definitely. I guess there's nothing dangerous than indifference or nothing dangerous than compromising your morals, right? Like that's that's what a lot of what this film is about. Compromise. Never compromise, not even in the face of Armageddon. How excited would you be for a Justice League, uh, Justice League Watchmen film uh, directed by Zack Snyder? I think he can do it without the studio. 
Like if he like you know does it in secret, doesn't tell Warner. <laughs> you think if he's like, like Shh. you think if he does the whole like Saddam in a hole. Yeah, like if he just does it by himself, like like he just takes a bunch of like actors like well known that would keep their mouth shut, take them to like a different country, to like Australia, and just say, listen, we're just we're just gonna make Justice League and right. Watchmen versus each other, but don't tell nobody. So sh- you didn't hear nothing. Jeff hear Johnson it. doesn't have to know anything. <laughs> you didn't hear it from me. I I, I would like to see that. Like I said, I think, is, if I think he, how can he is, not handle Justice? League? That's the thing is, I didn't see Justice League yet, but from what I hear, there's no way he messed up. It was definitely studio interference. It was definitely last minute cuts. All the all the all the bring ins and add ons. If he can handle stuff like da- like Dawn of the Dead, if he can handle Watchmen, if he can handle Watchmen, he can handle Justice League. You know, yeah, I think so. Dude, dude, the only difference is it's it's Justice League is a more large scale action. I also think that people need to explain to him the difference between the two. Because the more you understand the difference between the Justice League and the Watchmen, the more you'll get a better understanding of each team. Yeah, we each need the action character. of Man of Steel's last 45 minutes with all of Justice League's teamwork. Like, the, the way they did the building between each character arc was genius. It was great and it flowed perfectly. Was it long? Yes. But I, you know what? Sometimes I want a nice three hour movie. I don't yeah. mind it. And this also starts the beginning of Zack Snyder, the Zack Snyder's cuts, right? Like, the here's the director's cut of a longer film. That oh, yeah, because uh, Sucker Punch had a director's cut. Exactly. And then you start going with the BVS cut, the Justice League cut, the, you know, and, and things start rolling out past there. Um, because that's the thing. It's, it's, it's either watch the studio's version or watch my version. And a lot of people trust Zack Snyder as a director to watch his version. And then, and then they want to sell you with the Blu-ray, like buy this Blu-ray for ten ninety nine, and it has the the, the Zack Snyder cut. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wait, this wasn't in the I original. Saw that yeah, movie, like but this I have one, to buy this one now. Like, yeah, yeah. And then I, I, that's why sometimes I won't watch a movie in theaters if I hear there's too many like studio interferences and the director didn't get a lot of creative control. I will wait for it to come out on Blu-ray, and I will watch the director's intended version with yeah. all of his creative control. There's absolutely no point in watching half a movie. But we got to see this full movie, and I absolutely loved it. In conclusion, what would you say the Watchmen movie is about? The Watchmen movie is really about war and what happens if we lost it. And what happens if we don't have the necessary tools to fight another one. It, then it's also about what superheroing does to you when you're just a human. You know, a lot of these times, these these superheroes are super powered. So when they have like a high intelligence, and you know, like a, when they have like super speed or super strength, you know, they could be able to handle a lot of the things that a human can't. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to find the words, but emotions. It's all about emotions. This movie is okay. very emotional. From from how we feel if we lost the war to how we feel if we have superpowers to how we feel if we lost our chance of being the 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 good that we can be, you know, because... Oh, I'm just... I'm letting you answer first so I could take your answers and just make them... I g- give myself a little bit more time to, to have my answers. Because no, I yeah. do think... I, I agree with you. I they, It's about humanity. Yeah. That's what you were saying about emotions. It's about humanity, what it takes to be it's a human. It's like, what happens if you see... If you find a human where he has nothing left to give, nothing left to do, and well, you what, just keep pushing him and, and pushing him? And what is him. humanity? Is humanity... Um, is humanity... Is the perfect human really perfect or is humanity perfect in its imperfection like well, what is perfection wait, i think perfection thing. is just well, perspective well ozymandias is is what people would i guess i see as the ideal right he can do everything he can be everywhere he can and and yet he is amazed by someone like silk specter's ability to be born so that imperfect situation that silk specter that caused silk specter's birth ends up being the perfect example of humanity how accidents like we're all happy accidents and um they, it's not a it's about perspective it's not about like uh night owl's life isn't glamorous and rorschach isn't a millionaire but it's about how they feel about doing the things that they're doing and that's a lot about what humanity is is about the, our perspective how do we feel about the doing the things that we're doing how do we feel, how do sticking to our morals make us feel i think it's about nostalgia I think it's about um, losing your identity. I think it's about losing your value in a society that moves too fast to remember you. I think it's about um, we we see that with how uh, Night Owl One gets basically killed, you know, uh, beaten to death in his in his. Uh, oh, that w- that was so sad because you know the, he didn't even do anything. It's about he just it, mixed up his names. 
It's about the old saying about the road to hell is paved with good intentions because Ozymandias was no just trying to help. No good deed goes unpunished. Yeah, you know, Ozymandias was just trying to help out. This film is about so much, and I'm so glad that, you know, I saw it. I hope more people see it. I hope this uh, gets to the click and more people get more excited about seeing this this movie because no, yeah, If I can walk away from great. today with anything, it's that I hope more people watch this movie. And yes, listen, guys, it's about three hours and 25 minutes. It is. I understand. We both understand that's a long movie, and if you have to watch it in episodes, watch it in episodes. Watch like watch forty five minutes of it, and then just walk <laughs> away if you have to. You know, give yourself time to the process show. it. Like exactly, you know, have your little self a Watchmen week. You know, just watch a couple of minutes of it every day, just to give yourself time to process all of this information because it is a lot of information that gets thrown at you, but it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel dragged. You know, everything flows with an even pace. It's definitely a landmark film, and the book itself is a landmark book. Like it, it, it changed so much of what we know about comic books. So you owe it to yourself if you're a comic book fan, if you're a fan of superhero films, to watch Watchmen because uh, it will show you a different side and make you more gra- uh, gracious, have more gratitude towards. Listen, if you want to see what you got, Batman vs Superman could have been. If you want to watch what Justice League could have been, definitely throw on the Watchmen. It it doesn't. You have to watch it and pay attention. And you can't watch it passively. Um, it deals with a lot of big questions. Oh yeah, you definitely have to like topics. You can't be your your face inside your phone texting away while this movie is playing. You will miss a lot of crucial information. Everything is Easter egged. Everything is referenced. But like, if you give yourself the time and attention to detail of this film, it will reward you. Uh, you will see all the bits and pieces that they're trying to give you. I think this is a great uh, film, and I also think this is a great time to tell you guys that you can catch all these kinds of reviews, comic books, TV shows. I mean, we did Crisis on Earth X. We've done uh, Doomsday Clock. We got to do a little bit of Dark Knight's Metal, and now Watchmen. Like, literally, this is like the funnest thing in the world. How, how do you feel about this experience here? We got I got to ask, um, you know, everybody else who sits on the opposite side of this table how they feel. Um, how do you feel about this major issues and... And this ability, I guess, to talk about the things that you kind of love in the geek community. This this is definitely a beautiful environment. Everybody, this is a great, you know, just platform, you know, podcasting. Everyone podcasts. Everyone YouTubes. You know, not, not many people read internet forums anymore. So just any way to get your voice out there. And I, there's a lot of geeks out there in the fandom world. And I'm glad that we could all just, like, voice each other's opinions together. I'm glad we can find solace in this really weird world you know like and i i've been in the with the comic book click for about a year now and i just love this place every day it just gets better and better for us and and we and we're growing and the audience is growing grew. podcast time the audience we is growing grew. but we need a favor from you guys to help the audience grow even more tell your friends about this podcast go to podbeam.com and search comic book click that's click c-l-i-q-u-e go to itunes we're on itunes people go to itunes and uh look up the major issues podcast or major issues like i said again on podbeat.com and when you go to itunes try to leave us a review some comments let us know how we can get better because that's all we're trying to do here is get better we're trying to be your little weekly friend that knocks there's on no the door there's no such thing as bad publicity i have no so and come on we're taking creative criticism here that's all we that's all we're trying to do here comic book click is get better like i said so leave us a nice review say something say something nice leave us a couple stars uh if you do that you will help us get out there and get more members to the click and we can have more diverse conversations about the things that we love here at comic book click we need more people people as you know we're on facebook at facebook.com slash comic book click we're on instagram at comic book click you can use the hashtag comic book click to talk about all the latest and greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media we are constantly posting news we have merch on tpublic.com but it's all about major issues here that is the new venture that we are putting all our little hearts and souls into because we want to get the message down to you guys the click so don't forget to go to itunes don't forget to tell your friends about this podcast and this podcast can be found wherever podcasts are found this has been the major issues podcast episode three these things are just moving huh next, next thing blink will be episode 30 and then we could do a review on Watchmen uh uh two electric boogaloo i'm waiting i'm waiting for that movie to come out but this has been a major issues episode episode number three my name is george serrano aka the don 
And I am Dan the Comic Man. And we got major issues. And uh, don't forget, because you got to remember that you, yes you, are worthy.